Hello everyone, my name is Devin Bowers. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft where I've been working on code integrity systems within Windows for the past four years and I've been working on code integrity systems within Linux for the past two years. Uh, I'm here to talk about our new LSM in the last year of what we've done, what kind of prototypes we've added, and a feature that we're particularly proud of called uh, Integrity Namespaces. So real quick, what is IPE? IPE is a proposed LSM. It's not yet upstream, even though the patches are posted online publicly. That seeks to address code integrity for fixed function devices. Now, this is a little bit of a misnomer. It actually seeks to achieve more of a trust-based access control solution as opposed to solving code integrity in and of itself. So trust-based access control here means, hey, we need to prove the integrity of the file, and then the policy authorizes the uh, what is allowed to run based on that integrity claim. Also, what do I mean about fixed function devices? Well, fixed function devices are devices that essentially only do one thing. So an example that's gonna come up during this meeting, uh, during this presentation a lot is the uh, IoT device or a container host. So essentially they do one thing if you black box the container for in the case for a container host, all it does is run, launch, and report a container, which is essentially one big uh, mechanism of the management of a container. Other examples include, uh, you know, IoT devices, as I mentioned before. So recently I just bought a washer, much of my chagrin, it is connected to the Internet of Things, so the security is probably terrible. And uh, my washer only needs to be able to wash my clothes, you know, dry it, maybe emit a beep after the cycle is done. It doesn't need to run Doom, even though I'm sure somebody else will be able to find a way to get it to run Doom. So IP is really designed around these scenarios that help it out to get, uh, to ensure this promise of it continues to only run one thing. What this presentation is not is a walkthrough of all of IP. Uh, if you're interested in more of the policy constructs, you know, how does it work under the covers, things like that. I did a presentation last year at LSS that you can look up online and it should be able to answer all these questions for you. So real quick, uh, it's been a pretty good year for us at um, IP. Uh, we've added a prototype for SS Verity integration uh, that allows full parity of what we have for DM Verity and IP's uh, public postings. So you can both allow anything signed by the FS Verity built-in key, key yeah, built-in signatures, and you can allow um, or revoke based on a specific digest. Uh, that is provided by FS Verity Utilities. Additionally, we added support for uh, ver uh, specific file reads forcing integrity verification. So the way this works right now is if you have an application that you know opens with a specific path from user mode, so say, you know, I know my SSH D server, uh, opens etc ssh sshd i've seen the open syscall for that so you can write an ip policy hey anything anyone tries to open ss etc ssh sshd config for read make sure that it is an integrity verified object so in that sense we've we've managed to accomplish some stuff for legacy applications that you can't really can recompile but it's a relatively fragile system so this is why there's that in progress at the end, because we want to make that a little more robust. And the, the tentative way that we're thinking about doing that is the Trusted 4 patch set, which was just recently merged, uh, adding a new flag and say, hey, can I trust, this is this file descriptor trusted um, according to, you know, the trust access control in the system or the integrity claims, uh, either be through IP or IMA. And can, am I allowed to open this and should trust it as such? Um, and finally, the last big one is namespaces, which is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's not namespaces in the traditional sense of the word that you think of when you say clone uh, or with the clone system call or the unshare system call where you would actually create a namespace primitive like mount, pid, user, so on and so forth. It's more thought of like a, a variable policy or a contextual policy that um, a new trust 
uh, a new definition of trust is created for that that process tree. So it's a little bit different, and it's probably an inaccurate name at this point. So some motivations why we wanted to build this kind of uh, variable context, variable policy of trust for, for systems is that we want to cr increase IP's flexibility a little bit. So, you know, lockdown systems, as IP originally proposed it was for, are pretty rare. These lockdown systems imposed a ton of requirements uh, on the people building these systems. So and the whole system in itself must be designed around this trust-based access, uh, you know, access control. So things like updates need to be changed, that story needs to be reworked, the build systems now need to be set up for code signing correctly, you might have to maintain multiple PKI chains, it becomes a little bit of a night resourcing nightmare. That essentially means, you know, only the really big companies with, you know, hundreds of engineers working on a project can essentially get these systems working. So for that reason, they're pretty rare and we want to extend IP's applicability to the other kind of systems. Additionally, uh, some execution contexts are designed to be unrestricted uh, just by the function of the device. So I mentioned earlier, container hosts are kind of the example that we're working through for this entire presentation. Um, so container hosts in general create a, basically a sandbox that, that is trying to protect the rest of the system from being attacked or isolating a small fragment in the system while sharing the same kernel. So in this sense, we can we want to make IP more applicable to that scenario. Since I, the whole kernel is shared, if we were to use a normal IP policy, all the containers would be subject to that policy. It's not usually always a great thing, especially if you're running other people's containers as like a Kubernetes node or something like that. But you also want that kind of security policy for the host so that no one can just log into the host and execute whatever they want. So we just need a way to make sure that those execution contexts that are owned by other individuals or that are properly sandboxed and protected do not have a, a way to use IP and gain some benefit. Which brings me to my next point of a little bit of applicability. You know, trust-based uh, access control or proving the code integrity uh, of, of your executable resources uh, is useful. Even if it's only on one process, you still get some security benefit for that one process. And it's better to make you know small steps towards a good big security goal than uh, not adopt the security goal at all because it's too much work in the first place. Finally, some isolation principle. So IP, this is really good for least privilege since this trust context, this trust policy applies to a process tree. We can now define more of a least privilege style thing on our our processes and say, hey, my SSH uh, process shouldn't need to load kernel modules because I unless you, you know you use it as a, a remote connection for a headless terminal or something similar. And so I'm going to say, hey, SSHD, you're allowed to execute stuff, but I'm not allowing you to load kernel modules. And so that reduces the attack surface of SSHD kind of dramatically with loading like a potentially vulnerable kernel module or a you know, that was signed previously but has an exploit available. So this is kind of a, a classic example of the fork exec. I hope everyone's seen this before. It's a pretty basic thing on Linux. Um, so this is kind of basically how the IP namespace works from an interface perspective. As a consumer, what do I need to do to set up a namespace? Well, this is a pretty common pattern, so we kind of plugged into it immediately, and we said, hey, before you, after you call fork and you created that new process or the start of that process tree, you know, here's an interface. Here's a file that you need to write in SecurityFS because we're SecurityFS based as is typical for LSM. And then all you need to do is write what you want to set up your namespace like or your, your trust policy like so you define things like some metadata associated with the context uh, a name or an ID for the context itself uh, whether that that context starts in enforce or permissive and what the active policy what the policy should start with uh, that trust context and after that all you do is close uh, as you do with uh, the open syscall <laughs> 
And once that's done, your variable context is created. And then you can follow the rest of the calling flow for the classic fork exec to spin off your new process. After you, the last process calls exit, the namespace is cleaned up, or the trust context is cleaned up for the end user, you as the calling application without any, you needing to do anything. It's pretty easy, simple, low overhead, and uh, fits in nicely with this model. So real quick, I have a demo here. Uh, so this is a real system with IP enabled, a real distro. Uh, this is Arch Linux where I've applied the IP patch sets and built a full kernel. I think it's about two versions out of date now. Um, but it's a two-stage policy where we bootstrap trust. The init RMF, we start with trust for only the init RMFS. The init RMFS trusts the root FS partition, which is the DM Verity volume, which is why you see this error on FSCK because FSCK does not, um, it expects a read-write drive, and it's read-only because of DM Verity. So we'd look at dmessage, we can say, hey, we loaded the OS policy, which is that init RAMFS policy that expands the trust to the root FS. We can also see that BBF was blocked because it did something that did not match uh, IP's perspective of what it should be allowed to do. So if we look at that policy that was loaded in the init RAMFS, we can see everything we expect. We can see, hey, we're allowed to make uh, namespaces or contexts and we trust FS Verity signatures because of what I need for the demo to demonstrate my custom version of RunC. And then uh, DM Verity root hash, which is our root file system, and then the near FS itself. We also looked at IPs in a force. This confirms exactly what we expect in the, um, what's it called? The D message output. So if I try to run run C this container that I've added, uh, we're going to get permission denied as we expect because it doesn't match any of our integrity policy requirements because this is an unwritable drive. It's not a, you know the root FS, it's not in the unit FS, and it's not FS already signed. So everything's blocked, and as we fully expect, uh, even if we change root into it, no dice, and we can see that hey, the it's in the path, it's blocked. So we do root FS, and we try to run Steam locomotive, same deal, exactly what we expect. So that's kind of boring, right? It just shows that exactly what we'd expect that we've had no regressions from our, our past process. So now we're gonna do a little bit slightly different with the, uh, the namespace still on the same page of, we're still blocked even if we create a, a namespace with a currently active policy. Uh, so we have our OS policy which is exactly what we want. Uh, we're gonna spin off a new process by bash, that new process tree. Uh, we're gonna set our, our metadata, ID one, two, three, four, five, with our extra metadata of two, NS2. Start it with the OS policy, and then all we do is are finishing that right to security IPE new namespace. That will then create our new policy, and when we change root, it's still going to fail, because obviously we're spinning on the same policy. But we're in this brand new namespace, which you can see by that NS name, NS2 right there. And we can even see that the policy, hey, was started with OS policy and so on and so forth. Uh, now, if I manage to type exit, that we should not see any namespaces whatsoever in our, except for our root namespace in the namespaces tree. And lo and behold, it's right there, it's cleaned up for everybody automatically. So what happened there exactly, you know, this is a, a diagram of what we're going to follow through that whole example. Hey, so when we write in bash that created a new schedulable task in the kernel, when that new task is created, there's this convenient security hook that, that's called whenever a new task is created, and we just say, hey, inherit the current namespace immediately. So we just, you know, assign our little LSM blob memory region to say point to whatever the parent's name uh, task is, and then return back to fork. When we call write, which is a brand new part of our system call, we just check the restrictions on the current namespace. So, you know, are we allowed to create namespaces of ourselves, other things like that? Is it required to have a policy? Things of that kind of nature. And then if that all succeeds, all goes, we set it up, we allocate, we do all the fancy stuff that we need to do to make sure that we're going to start in a good state. After that, all we do is swap the, swap the two regions of memory on the task. So, hey, the current task now gets a slightly different namespace. 
uh, that we've already set up and made sure that it's completely active, and then we return to write. When you call exec, we just check against the tasks uh, active policy. So that's in the, you know, that context that I was talking about earlier, the namespace itself. And then when something calls exit, we decrement the reference and you know, when that reference count equals zero, that means there's no more policies that are a reference to it. And we schedule the free. Pretty easy. So a little less contrived, a little less arcane. Let's walk through, you know, more of a concrete example of how, how something could be set up using this. So we start off, as, as I said, we're going to use a container or a Kubernetes host scenario. Uh, the host is still fixed function. It's deploy and run the container. Uh, we're just black boxing what the container does. So the system might ultimately look something like this. You got, you know, system D, Mobi, which is Docker, for those of you that don't, uh, don't know that split. And you might have something like this. Hey, you know, every container namespace has an allow all policy. And then the specific policy for the root partition is allow host only, you know, allow children to be created and, but require a policy to have in our child. So this comes, this environment comes with a little bit of requirements, you know, workloads are unsigned, they're isolated from the host, but the host itself is immutable and high uptime perf sensitive because if you're in the, you know, the cloud wars, uh, one percentage of perf lose you customers. And finally, the big one is that as the host owner is not the same as the container owner. The host owner is some, is a person that has no contact with the, a, uh, container owner and vice versa. So it's important that we be able to accommodate basically the least restrictive needs or while also allowing the container owner, if they have the knowledge and the technical expertise to leverage exactly what they need to do to set up their own, you know, namespace for their container. So in this, we're going to use that same system before. We're just going to log in real quick and we're going to load a more restrictive policy because we want to trust only the host. So this first more restrictive policy I've called, uh, you know, IP restrict very, very uh, intuitively. Uh, we're just going to load that into the kernel by catting it to the uh, new policy node, which adds it to exactly our current uh, context. So IP new policy. We've created and loaded it. If we look at the policies node in the IP security tree, uh, we have, hey, there's that host lockdown policy. So we're just going to make this active. Uh, this is done by writing one to uh, the active policy name. Well, first we're going to show the, the policy and prove, you know, hey, those namespaces, you're only allowed children, you have to require policy, you have to require enforce it. And we are only allowing SSRI signatures because I needed a custom version of Run-C. And then also DM Verity, this specific DM Verity root hash, which is fine because we've left the new run with us. And uh, DM Verity root hash is our specific root FS. So if I echo one to active, it's going to make that policy active. And now we're now enforcing. This is kind of boring because there's nothing really changing about the execution state. But we can see that it was loaded and then activated. That 1800 event is to load. Something was loaded into the kernel. The 1802 event was, hey, this was made the active and enforcing policy. So if I create that new, pro if I first run uh, my enable FS Verity script, which uh, loads a my key into the FS Verity key ring because it's a slightly different key ring than DM Verity, which uses the system built in key ring. Um, and then I write the namespace policy that I'm going to be used for these container namespaces uh, so that I can use it when I set up my, my namespace itself. So if we look at this uh, content of this namespace, this policy that we're using for our children, we can say, hey, it, it just allows everything, but it, you're not allowed to create namespaces of your own because I, you know, I don't trust you that much. So then we're just gonna quickly, you know, go to the var demo. We're gonna try to run run C. My custom version of run C, you know, this is really run C, nothing, nothing sketchy. You can see the commit v100, dirty, real help text, so on and so forth. 
So if I try to run even the upstream version of run C, it's going to fail. This is exactly like we expect because hey, you can't create a new name, it doesn't know how to create a new namespace and fails immediately. If I try to use my custom version of run C, we get into the container because it's created a namespace. And we can run Steam Locomotive. There goes Steam Locomotive right across. It's a fantastic application if you need people to learn how to type LS correctly. So if we look at the namespaces tree, we should be able to see our namespace that 98765 is new. That's exactly what we're running. If we look at the policies within that 98765, uh, we have that NS policy, which is exactly what we loaded before. And if we exit that namespace, our last reference is dropped and we are free. There's no more namespaces, it's cleaned up on behalf of the user, and we're good to go. So what happened there exactly is we have our typical container stack here. We're starting from run C to the right. And in run C, there is that nice little fork exact diagram that we saw earlier. In this fork exec, just like our proposed changes, it does the same kind of thing where it calls fork, creates the namespaces, and these are the official namespaces like mount, pit, user, whatever, uh, the app armor, and then it calls the security systems to build their own, you know, more contextual uh, policies or to apply to that container. So app armor goes and seccomp, which isn't an LSM, but is a very similar, provides a similar security value, and then SE Linux. So we just slid IP right at the end there uh, to do our open, write, and close that we mentioned previously. And it's important that we go at the end because when other you know, security systems need to be set up, we're changing essentially what is allowed to be accessed as far as uh, you know, execution or reading. So the other security systems might have, uh, you know, like libse Linux, uh, and it might not be allowed by this new uh, trust policy, so we want to go at the end and make those applications as late as possible, just before we start the container appropriately. So now we're getting into more of the theory about, or in the design of how we created a LSM namespace. So in, in, when we originally approached our design, there was two approaches that we ultimately considered. A general security namespace, so this would be something that would be like a more official mount user PID namespace that allows uh, multiple LSMs to leverage the, kind of the same kind of framework and create something that is appropriate for their uh, their needs. This is a really good idea in theory, but it falls short in execution. The reason is because you can't manage to solve any of the harder questions when it comes to namespaces on behalf of the LSMs. So things like how do you reconcile two conflicting uh, policies? How do you, you know, if there's a super uh, policy inherited above or like in the root namespace, does the, how does that translate to everything in, in its children namespaces? and things like permissions, like who has permission to view its policies and security FS. So this turns into a really complicated problem that isn't really possible to solve at the LSM layer as an abstraction. So it essentially just turns into LSM blobs where you're giving a reserved memory region for, and maybe a, a more customized interface that, that will ferry information to the correct LSM and it just turns into LSM blobs. So we abandoned that idea pretty quickly and we went into LSM specific, you know, namespaces and we created for IP. The concept it was pretty natural to be expanded. The old approach was essentially we already had an implicit context. It was for init and it being the first, you know, uh, first thing spun up on the system. And that was all that we had our, our trust context for. So all we did was make that init be generic. So it could be login, could be shell, could be anything you want, you name it, it can be it. And it applies to a process tree. So a process in all of its descendants, no matter how far deep you go. And it relies on, so in general, this is, this is kind of the principle of, it's just a, a new trust context for that process. If you want to isolate things, you should be using the other more uh, other namespaces, which are far more official for the mount, PID, and user namespaces. 
So in, in general, we also wanted to have some stuff for the policy. You know, the policy should be able to both restrict and expand controls, which I'll go into in the next slide a little bit. And we needed the parent to be able to provision limited information about the children, because as soon as we jump into that namespace, essentially we're treating this as uh, it's its own thing, but whoever set us up, we trusted at the time that they made that decision. So for IP's namespace properties, we needed some flexibility. You know, the existing namespaces enforce rigidity. So in the early in design, we were there was a comment from one of our our the people that we were reviewing this with, and it says, "Hey, can you attach this to the user namespace? Uh, Doesn't that make more sense? Because you know, uh, privileged namespaces." Uh, don't have a user namespace and does it make sense for this to be a separate thing? There was uh, two responses to that. The first is it's a pretty uh, heavyweight system for, for a user namespace. Um, so it, like a user namespace would work for a container host, which runs generally on privileged containers. Unprivileged containers don't have a user namespace. You know, root is real root. Uh, you know, but with a multi-user system, so, you know, multiple people logging in where every single user logging in has a different right to what is allowed to be executed through that trust policy. Uh, it's pretty expensive to, you know, spin off a new user namespace every time you log in. And does that even make sense from a conceptual point of view for the system? This was also raised during my presentation at LSS this year uh, of how does this make sense with privileged namespaces. Well, it's still on the same vein as like SE Linux policy. So LXC also recommends, you know, you use, if you're going to use privileged containers, uh, you should lock them down with mandatory access control system. Privileged containers still exist. Uh, <laughs> so this is just another way to also further restrict and control and protect a, a privileged container in this sense because the privileged container can be started with a fixed policy that you know it's going to run. So you can mitigate some of the damage by having a privileged container, which has more control to effectively screw up your own system. Additionally, you know, requirements can change for namespaces and our implementation should be conscious of that. So examples of that include like, you know, we might have a VM host, uh, the node in the cloud is responsible for only spinning up a VM and it's, you know, uh, has this trust based access control. It says, hey, I'm not allowed to execute anything that I don't trust uh, based on this code integrity claim. It's locked down by default. You know, there's no debugging tools, but when something goes wrong, someone needs to be able to log in and diagnose what's going on. As soon as that happens, they need debugging tool access unless you know you have logs a million miles long and s-trace on every single says you need to figure out what's going on that way so this poor soul needs to log in and get access to debugging tools and it needs to expand when you log in that integrity policy that trust policy needs to expand to now include the number of uh, debugging tools available for the diagnostic purposes and then when they leave that node it will restore the old integrity requirements. Additionally, container host, which is the example that we've been working with, so I'm gonna breeze through this, you know, host is integrity verified, the containers need to run, which may or may not be. Um, so we can remove the integrity requirements in the container or we can alter them uh, in the case of privileged containers where you can lock it down even further. Additionally, the final example is what I called, you know, shared EDU Linux is just off the top of my head. So we have, you know, a situation where everyone, a bunch of students are using the same computers, like a laptop cart or something similar. And when you log into a laptop a computer, you you know, you have all, especially at schools, it's completely restricted. You can't run any games or anything. Um, so, you know, this application control is, you know, 99% of students have the same level of application control in trust-based execution as before. However, when you're a computer science student, you do need a lot of things. You need a compiler, you need an IDE, you need to run your own code. So how do you do this? When I was in high school, they gave me a whole separate account, which is a very heavyweight solution, a whole separate computer. Instead, why don't we just make it so that you can create a different kind of execution context when you log in 
so these customer uh, these uh, students can basically execute uh, exactly what they need to do which aren't typically signed so it creates this kind of system where we have different integrity requirements in general IP takes the approach for all these these requirements can change by making the policy being the driving force to enforce the requirements so things like the policy can say is you know require a policy to be active always require everything to be enforced no more permissive switching for you and prevent additional namespaces from being created the next big topic of IP's you know namespace properties is a little bit of isolation so when you do say the word namespaces and as I've said uh, namespaces is probably a bad name for for this particular uh, feature uh, it implies isolation from from other parts of the system and in an implicit hierarchy you know everything belongs to a namespace implicitly and higher in the namespace higher in the tree of this hierarchy can see lower in the tree or have more power over it so to speak so in a general isolated system, you might have something that looks like this, where, you know, you have uh, namespaces with various different policies, very different applications, nesting, and so on and so forth. So this no, originally, when we designed this, we wanted, uh, you know, namespaces to be always able to create a, a bond, basically, between a root namespace and a lower namespace and have the policy in the root namespace effect continuously over time uh, all of its children so this created actually an issue which is why we abandoned it with this dependency graph of between these higher level namespaces and lower level namespaces there's a lot of edge cases regarding when a process dies in the middle you know your integrity requirements now suddenly change what happens so instead we just kind of abandoned that issue entirely and said hey when you create a policy uh, when you create a namespace we provision the initial state and just leave it alone uh, they are now effectively completely isolated in separate instances for our purposes only used for permission checking so additionally there's this interfaces so in our example we say for, for, for our interfaces, we said they're exposed through SecurityFS. SecurityFS has one instance across the entire kernel. When you mount SecurityFS in a new place, it brings the whole tree with you. So everyone can see every SecurityFS uh, node. So in the case of privileged containers, you can see now everything, every single node that you, 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 know, you want. So we're just gonna assume that all, all forms of namespaces or anything that's using our IPE namespaces can mount security of us and see everything that they care about. Um, and then we, we need to assume, since that is true, we, everyone can see the namespaces. So if we have a multi-tenant, uh, you know, device, something that has multiple users, so for example, you know, the US military or, you know, the US government and the Chinese government, if that ever were to be an actual thing, or you know, Home Depot, Microsoft, Google, whatever, they're all running on the same host. Uh, we need to make sure that they keep their, they're separate from everyone else, because obviously you don't want another company to be able to view, another entity to view into another entity's container, um, especially if that is part of a targeted attack wherever you can. So for that reason, there's, there's, there's two things. You can name the namespaces however you want. Um, you just have to be aware that when you identify a namespace, there is going to be portions that leak. So if you name all your containers based off what tenants using them, you're implicitly leaking some information there. So we've created this kind of purpose, this division between identity and purpose in IP's policies or IPs, namespaces. We have the ID, which is something that you expose to everybody. Uh, everybody knows who your ID is, and it can be whatever you want. And then we have a name on the inside of our namespace listing, which is more metadata, like who am I, what am my purpose? This doesn't provide any security benefit. Uh, the real security benefit of protecting these interfaces is handled through a permission handler in the, the directory and saying, hey, Back to that first concept up with uh, the hierarchy, only if you belong to a higher namespace than me in my tree can you view my information. 
So in our multi-tenant example, the root namespace, the owner of the container can see all into the, you know, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, whatever containers. And the Microsoft, Google, Amazon containers can't see into each other because they're not higher than them in the tree. So we divide these two concepts so that, you know, we can associate metadata and contain private data with these other namespaces, but still have a way to identify the containers as a, for a unique primary key. This results in only the attacker knows how many namespaces there are in the box, if you use anonymized IDs, and it mitigates that information disclosure attack. You know, so this implementation isn't without its flaws, I will admit. Uh, there's some serious issues with management. So in general, when you come to management of namespaces, there's two philosophies, a centralized and decentralized management story. In general, I favor centralized management because if you do a system as a centralized point, updating comes a lot easier and you know, you only have one point of failure to investigate when something goes wrong. However, right now we have this problem you're essentially trusting the namespaces completely blind that they're not lying what kind of names, what namespace they're in. Because currently there's no, you know, extension to say, hey, based on your process ID or who's contacting me, I can look up in the root namespace what namespace you belong to. So this is a big flaw that we're looking to solve eventually. Um, in general, you can also get around this with a decentralized namespace. Uh, a decentralized management solution. However, that comes with its own issues like updating. You basically have to maintain a separate library for every single thing that wants to manage their own namespaces. Uh, that involves updating and cascading updates and it becomes a very complicated process very quickly. So for future work for IP, we want to be upstream eventually. This is going to be a long and arduous process. Uh, based on my current postings. The patches are available upstream as of today, October 17th. And I would really, uh, you know, if anybody's interested in reviewing, please feel free to jump on and, you know, criticize me, boil me alive, whatever, do the Linux kernel maintainer thing. Uh, next, you know, support for targeting specific signers via policy, which is the next big feature um, that we're going to try to tackle. So the key rings kind of have a, a cross pollution issue in our view. That basically when you add something to a key ring and validate a signature against said key ring, you can match any key in that key ring whatsoever. So if you have something like a, a kernel mode signer versus a user mode signer, you have no way of knowing which key it matched or forcing the key to match to a particular set other than creating a whole separate key ring. So we want to have a way in policy that you say, hey, use, you know, our system trusted key ring, but for current modules, I only want to see this certificate as the signer. And for, you know, the standard execution workflows, I only want to see this certificate or these configuration files, I want to see this certificate. So the policy gets to drive a little bit more finer grain selection of what the certificates are. Additionally, I talked about this a little bit earlier. We want to support that trusted four patch set. Uh, this is something that we want to do when we're upstream and not the other way around because it's much better as a system as a whole to get upstream so everyone, you know, gets the goodness. The implementation is tightened and hardened and everyone feels comfortable or at least less bad about the implementation before you start changing around other things in the kernel. So additionally, before the last two examples kind of glossing over a little bit, uh, hardened resistance against rollback attacks. So IP has a policy version. I mentioned this before in my last year's presentation. We don't allow you to roll back to policy versions. So, you know, preventing that full rollback to vulnerable policies, but the kernel loses all state when you reboot. So, uh, you know, the policy version gets reset back to zero, giving you a, wind a slight window of opportunity to use an insecure policy to potentially compromise the system. We want to do something about that. We want to investigate that, figure out how to close that gap. And then the final big thing that we're, that's going to come much, much later is hopefully we would like to figure out how to verify eBPF programs. Uh, we've done some initial work in the space to see, you know, how feasible it would be with the loader rearranging instructions and all that stuff. Um, but it's somewhere long down the road. And on that note,
And on that note, I would like to thank you for your time, and I will take any questions at this time.